Good morning, everyone. So, good morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is, after all, the Hard Rock uh, Hotels and Casinos. So, so it is an achievement that everyone turns up early in the morning. Right? It's, it's unlike uh, most of the other conference halls we had in like San Francisco and so many other places where you really have nothing to do. You just wake up, you go, you have breakfast, you turn up at the hotel room, uh, the, the conference hall. Right? Uh, so thank you for being here. <clears throat> uh, let me just quickly introduce myself and talk about why I'm up here, why I'm talking about how to build an API-first enterprise, and then we'll dive right into it. Right? Uh, again, along the way, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. We can keep this very informal. Uh, I'll use a standard set of slides, but I'll talk a lot. Right? So, so you, most of the stuff are in the, in the talk. Uh, I've been with the company for 11 years, going on 12 years now. Uh, I'm the chief solutions officer. What does that mean? What that means is I head the solutions architecture team, which is a, a great set of people. Like If you are customers, you would have worked with one of them or two of them often, uh, quite already. Uh, very technical team. Uh, they, are the, they are basically the ones who, who work with you when, you when you come in as a lead. They help you with the architecture, and then they stay on when you become a customer and become your technical owner, along with some of the other teams of WC2. Right? Uh, I also head the solution side of WC2. So I'm responsible for looking at the various vertical plays that we have. Uh, so we, we have some, some accelerators on the healthcare side. We have some artifacts on the banking and financial services side. We have a bunch of customers on the government side. So we have some blueprints, architecture, so on and so forth. So I'm responsible for looking at that area as well. Right? Uh, so along my journey and my team's journey, we have worked with around 9,000 plus opportunities, uh, leads coming in, talking to us about their integration problems, their API management problems, their identity problems. Uh, we have worked with around 2,500 plus customers and around 6,000 projects overall. So, so we've seen some of the good stuff and the bad stuff. Right? And that's the basis of my presentation uh, today. Uh, on, on day one, on the tutorial day, I did a session for the partner group, and, and I spoke about abstractions and the ability to think in abstractions. Right? You saw the keynote on the first day. So Sanjeeva spoke about where we are heading, where WSO2 is heading, uh, and, and then we had a great talk on, on dark matter, and that theme will continue, and that platformless theme will continue. Right? But the bigger picture thinking here is, as software engineers, can we think from the bigger picture perspective? Can we look at the abstract story? Right? Because if you look at software engineering, it's, it's all about abstractions. Right? In, the, in the database days, you had RDBMS, you had SQL. Uh, in the computer days, of course, which you had, you had basically the VMs, and then you had Kubernetes on the infrastructure level, which was a great abstraction. Uh, you, you basically have 4, 4GL programming languages as a great abstraction. You have low code and no code as a great abstraction. So different levels of abstraction. And, and today we are talking about platforms and then platformless as a pretty big abstraction. But one of the key abstractions in software engineering is APIs. Right? Remember, I'm not talking about API management. I'm talking about APIs. And API has a broad definition. API is really an interface for anything. It doesn't mean a REST API with a JSON payload, not always. It can mean anything, anything with an interface, right? So APIs are your business abstraction. If you look at an organization uh, today, if you have IP, business IP, you use APIs to basically encapsulate that IP, right? If you have system know-how, you use APIs to encapsulate that know-how. Uh, we, we work with one of the larger uh, investment organizations in the Northeast. And one of their core tenets of using APIs was to basically encapsulate their mainframe knowledge. Because they had all these mainframe systems. Uh, the people who programmed the mainframes like 30 years ago had left the company or were on the verge of retiring. And they wanted to modernize. And they didn't have the time and effort to basically switch from mainframes to a much more cloud-native system. So they built APIs so that people can now build applications and modernize just using those APIs and forget about the mainframe system behind. Right? So that's one of the core, core values of APIs. Right? So again, I'm not here to talk about why you need to use APIs. We are way past that stage. Uh, but I just wanted to throw up two, two charts here. 
one from Postman, the state of APIs on, the, on your left-hand side, uh, one from Gartner, which is a bit old, but still very relevant. Right? So if you look at the takeaways from this, I would categorize this into like two or three main categories. One very important one is still, how do you promote reuse within your organization? And that's, that's kind of the holy grail of software engineering, right? If you have an organization, whether it's a 10-person IT team or whether it's a 8,000-person IT team, like we're working with one org which has an 8,000-person development team, right? That's pretty massive. So whether, regardless of the size, how do you promote reuse? How do you get developers to reuse something else that someone else has built? Because you know the law of compounding interest, right? Compounding returns. If someone uses an API and builds something, and then someone else uses that and builds something else, you have a compounding effect, right? So eventually, the return of investments using APIs is pretty massive. And, and there are organizations who do this as well. They, they look at the ROI on these <coughs> APIs. So one is, how do you encapsulate internal IP, and how do you get developers to increase productivity? That's one big use case. A second big use case, uh, if you listen to the panel discussion yesterday, Prakash, who was formerly from Trimble, said, we need to do a better job at getting involved in the ecosystem, the ecosystem play. Right? So for most organizations, that means, OK, I've got my internal house in order. How can I now expose APIs to my partners, my, my third-party developers, so that they can build value on top of this? And I can then monetize it. Uh, again, going back to yesterday's Hard Rock keynote, right? Macario spoke about the future vision where everything's internal today, but if you expose APIs to a Google or an Expedia or to a, a Booking.com, right, and, and let them access these APIs real time, then that, that adds value. Fun fact, we work with one of the large uh, hospitality partners who exposes APIs. Google and Expedia don't consume real-time APIs today. Right? If, you, if you go for a booking, it is at least half a day old or one day old because it's a batch operation. You, you drag and drop, there is a buffer there. There is a chance that it'll, it'll be wrong, but there is a buffer there. Because the minute you expose APIs to like a Google and Expedia, and you do a slider pull to say, I want this many days, that's like 10 different API calls going through real time. Right? So that's, that's really large internet scale APIs. Right? So, so those are the two main areas that uh, people are looking at API management. There are some other areas, but the big categories. So my talk is on API-first development. Again, as I said, it's not API management. So what is this? What does this mean? Uh, API-first development doesn't just mean you are doing an API-first or contract-first instead of a code-first. Right? That's, that's, that's a narrow definition. API-first means you think in terms of APIs for everything. You think product. Right? So for example, if you are building a back-end service, if you are wrapping a mainframe, you start thinking, how can I expose this interface? What's the right way to expose this interface? How long is this going to live? How many use cases is this going to handle? And is this, is this a viable product? Right? So that's API-first thinking. So that's the broader thinking across the board. It's not saying, I need an API manager, I need an API gateway, I need to expose this to this party. It's not just that. Right? You're going, going beyond that. So I'm going to go through a set of pictures to take you through that journey. And then we will talk along the way, we'll talk through that journey. Uh, as I go along, on the right-hand side, there's a few screenshots that I'm throwing up. These are from Corio today, right? as an example. But it, this is not a session about Corio, right? So, so basically, you can use the WC2 API manager. You can use the APK uh, platform from WC2, the API platform for Kubernetes. You can use Mule, Apigee, anything, right? It's, it's basically just showing you some concrete examples. OK, so when you say full lifecycle API management, we talk about, OK, you have APIs. How do you create proxies for those APIs? How do you test those APIs? How do you manage those APIs? How do you expose those APIs, right? That's, that's, that's the standard definition of a full lifecycle API management, right? Uh, if you can see here, there are two major actors 
There are API developers who, who create these APIs. And then there are API consumers on the other side who consume these APIs. Right? The developers can then be broken up saying there are the actual people who do the implementation. There are maybe a different set of people who say, I'm going to publish these APIs in a certain format. Uh, they decide what the interface should look like, what the documentation should look like. And then you have all these consumers out there. This is pretty straightforward. right? Uh, but one critical category we are seeing in many organizations today is this API product manager concept, especially in the larger organizations. This person's role is to define the roadmap for the APIs, to define the actual APIs itself, right? to think through what an API should look like, and to basically do the evangelism ar around the platform. Uh, there was a recent study by Gartner on why API strategies are failing in some organizations. And more than 50% of the reason was, was this lack of an API product manager. And, and we are seeing this as we work with our customers. Some of the organizations are having this role. And that person is now responsible for the API program. So, so we talk to that person. So that person is the business owner of the API platform. Uh, and so in these mature organizations, API management is a business metric, right? And there's a business unit and a business function to basically uh, address those, right? But let's go beyond the uh, definition of a full lifecycle API management, right? So, so one of the important things that the product manager is responsible for is to design the right types of APIs. Now, there are different ways you would do this, right? So one is the application teams come and tell you, OK, I need these 100 fields. And you turn around and say, OK, I'll give you those 100 fields as an API. Right? That's one way. It's a request, and you're doing it one way. There's a second way where you're saying, I have a bunch of backend services, and I'm going to expose these as APIs. So I'm going to do a full exercise on how to build these APIs. Uh, we did this in WSO2. We have an internal digital operations team. There'll be a talk from a member of that team as well uh, in, in this track. And we re-architected all of our internal APIs to say, here's a bunch of APIs. I'm going to expose it in a certain way. And then we started looking at how should the APIs be designed, uh, how many resources per API, what are the domains these APIs fall into, uh, are these RESTful APIs or GraphQL or WebSocket, so on and so forth. Right? Um, and it, one, of the, one of the takeaways there is, we decided our domain layer or system layer, the underlying API layer, doesn't change often. It's, it's a fixed layer. So, so it's less velocity in terms of change. So it can be a rest layer, right? Because it's fixed, it's standardized. We don't want to change it every six months, so on and so forth. But then there's a layer above, which is consumed by the application teams. And they want the flexibility of managing those APIs. They want to say, when I call this API, I want 10 responses, 10 resources, instead of the 100 resources. So the velocity is much higher, velocity of change. So we went with GraphQL for that layer. Right? So, so there are multiple technologies today that you can pick and choose from when you're designing the API. Uh, there's a quote from Einstein uh, who said, if, if I get a problem, I spend 95% of the time defining that problem and 5% of the time defining the solution. Right? That's a critical aspect when it comes to designing APIs. So API design is a, is, a, is a key function, and we've seen this with many of our customers. OK, so going beyond API management and just, just exposing those proxies, right? you do need to talk about the implementation side. Because there's someone implementing these APIs. There's, there's a physical representation of the API. right? So, so there are teams that can be building microservices that expose interfaces and APIs. It can be in Ballerina, Java, Go, Node.js, whatnot. Right? So, so that has to be looked at when you're talking about an API lifecycle. Because if you go set up an API platform that is independent of all of this, and then you tell the teams, OK, you build your APIs, you have Swagger, all of that. But then you come to this other platform, and out of band, you have to now create a proxy. You're creating friction. Right? So the develop experience goes down. So it is important that your API platform is part of your automation of the full software development lifecycle. It has to be part and parcel of that. Right? So that's, that's one of the core tenets we are looking at 
in terms of how we talk to customers. Like, how can you bridge the gap? How can you bring this in to the full story? Right? So API implementation is a big part of it. Integration is a big part of it as well. In most cases, integration is not a totally independent problem space. Right? Because you're building your services. These services need to connect to some back-end systems, which might be integration. These services might need to do some transformation of the payload, which might be an integration problem. And then these services need to expose APIs as proxies. Right? So it's all part of the same problem. Right? So, so what we're saying is, OK, treat it as the same problem. Right? So API-first development means there will be integrations as APIs as well. And then, of course, you come to the deployment side. Right? So once you build all of this, you need to deploy them. Uh, you, you might have heard from yesterday as well. API gateways are commodity now. It is nothing special about gateways, right? Gateways can be just an Envoy proxy. It can be a sidecar. It can be in the Kubernetes layer. It can be a big, large gateway at the edge. But gateways are a commodity, right? So the value comes in the governance side, the monitoring side, the observability side, the API first uh, development side, so on and so forth. So in, in Corio, again, I'm just going to give you a Corio example. You have the ability of deploying it on, on a cloud, a SaaS, uh, on your own data plane, on premises, so on and so forth. But the, the point here is gateways are commodity. So your APIs need to run wherever you need it to run. Right? If you have your backend system sitting on premises, there's really no point going and having a gateway on AWS and then always coming back to the backend system. Right? Th that doesn't make sense. Right. If your databases are sitting in like rack space or somewhere, maybe it makes sense to have your gateways in rack space as well. OK. So moving past that, now you exposed your APIs. Now you come to the part of getting users to consume the APIs. Right? So if you look at this picture, if you're following along, uh, we expose the APIs. We need to share the APIs. One critical part is the developer portal. Right? You, you know the developer portal. W02 has one. Many platforms have one. Uh, this might be an internal developer portal, or it might be an external developer portal. Right? So for your internal teams or external teams. Right? So, so basically, in developer portals, again, I'm just going, not going into theory. I want to touch upon a few things. One of the th key things here is the onboarding side. Uh, <clears throat> we work with some financial organizations who use the API platform and developer portal to cut down on the onboarding time for their enterprise customers. Uh, so there was one customer who, who took like around four months to onboard an enterprise customer, and, and they managed to cut it down to around two days. And that's a huge business value. And that's a business value directly coming out of having developer portals and having uh, APIs. Right? So this, this onboarding of customers and cutting down the time is, is, is an important thing for business. Because at the end of the day, you need to look at like, what's the business drivers of, of these platforms uh, as well. Right? So it's just a few screenshots of uh, actual platforms running on WC2, which are either skinned or, or they use the vanilla product out of the box. Right? OK, so developer portal is one side. As I said, developer portals can be external for your partners, your, custom, your, your third party developers, or it can be internal. Uh, in WSO2, in our experience, so we are working with maybe around 500 plus customers who are using API management, uh, subscription customers. Out of them, 70% of them purely do internal API management. That shows that it's a very important aspect, right? But in, and, and in this one, there's another concept that we've started talking about, which is this concept of a marketplace. So, the marketplace and dev portal are synonymous, really. Like you can talk about one or the other. It's the same similar terminology. But there's one important difference to talk about. So if you take an enterprise, let's say you take a, a thousand person, a thousand IT team enterprise, right? And everyone wants to build their services, their APIs. They want to do it in a self-service manner. Right? There needs to be some governance, but in self-service manner. Any enterprise software development requires the use of third-party APIs. Right? So let's say you are in warehouse management you and third-party logistics. You need to use something like Google Maps and Waze and things like that. Uh, let's say you are in um, uh, some, uh, telco, in, in a retail space or telco space. You might need to use Twilio's APIs, so on and so forth. So 
we as enterprises start thinking about all these governance, but we let users use whatever third-party APIs they want to. And that's starting to become a cybersecurity risk, and, and uh, uh, so many, so many f uh, red flags are being raised in that space. So enterprises are trying to figure out how do you solve that problem. And that's a gap today in the API management space, right? So that's what we are trying to solve with the internal enterprise marketplace, where we are saying, OK, if, if 1,000 developers need to use Twilio, there will be an administrator who says, I'm going to wrap the Twilio API and expose it as version 2 for my enterprise, and that will be available in my marketplace. The credentials are baked into that, so it's, it's a baked-in connection. And developers can only use things that are published in my enterprise API marketplace. And that gives you an enterprise way of controlling who can con access what. And that's very critical, right? In today's day and age, it's very critical, whilst allowing the whole uh, third, sorry, self-service model to continue. So that's, that's something we are actively working on. We have a lot of features in that space, but we're actively working on how to improve that. So again, if you have feedback in that space, just let us know, talk to us. Right? So, OK, we spoke about Dev Portal, we spoke about Marketplace. Visibility of those APIs are critical. Like, who can see these APIs? Is it external? Is it internal? Uh, is it only partners? Right? So we have a lot of visibility controls there as well. So that brings us to this picture. So what's API first development? It is basically going all the way from a service to your consumers. Right? How do you expose your APIs? How do you build your APIs? How do you test your APIs? How do you manage your APIs? Governance is a key question that we get asked quite often. Like, if I allow self-service, how do I work with governance? Uh, again, going back to this 8,000 team example, uh, this, this organization wants developers to do everything self-service, but they also want to make sure that you don't publish the wrong APIs. Right? So one way they're doing that is uh, they have a, a linting capability. WSO2 has the stoplights linting language support, so you can, you can write some lint rules uh, where you say, OK, this API, like if you are publishing in the US, it has to be a US date format versus an EU date format. Uh, if you are publishing like credit card information, it has to be in the post method. It cannot be in get, right? So certain rules, right? Uh, so, so you can have a lint. And when APIs are being published, it goes through the linting process. And it has to pass. It has to have an 80% mark to be able to go past it. And there are specific companies also who do this as a, as a practice. So we can integrate into all of those if that, that part is very important for you. Now, wrapping this up and bringing this to a broader story, uh, there's a good article in 2023 from Christian Posta, who is, who is an uh, API evangelist, about that the API lifecycle is the software development lifecycle. And then he has a catchy title. He says, API management is dead. Use an internal developer platform to build APIs. Right? Uh, so so we, we believe in that as well. So yes, you can start with API management perfectly fine. Uh, if you've solved the rest of the problems and you have to solve the API management space, perfect. But you have to start thinking in terms of the bigger picture story. So we, we spoke about API first development, but there is a lot of underlying actors there that really make this a reality, right? They are, they are the elves uh, behind the scenes, right? So you have the platform engineering teams who, who take care of the CI CD part and the zero trust part and the automation part and the canary deployments and so on and so forth, right? Uh, again, developers like to code. They like automation. So if you tell them, now go to this UI and click, click, click to expose an API, they're not too happy. It might be an API product manager's role, but developers are not too happy. So if you have an automation pipeline, it is critical that you tie everything into that the publishing of APIs, the testing of APIs, uh, all of this as part of the pipeline. Let's say it starts with uh, a, like a GitHub or GitLab or something like that, and it basically picks up and continues from there. Right? So, so this is where I think if you listen to the theme of the conference, we've been talking about platformless. API first is a big, big part of that. But there are a few other helper functions, right? cloud native. So the ability to run these APIs or run these services in any cloud using the cloud capabilities. Uh, platform engineering, like who does what behind the scenes? How can you abstract that? And then at the end of the day, very, very important is develop experience. Because at the end of the day, whatever you do, 
even if every company is a software company, developer experience is critical because it's your developers who are building stuff. They are the ones who help you go to market quick, right? So bringing this home to Corio. So we spoke about API-first development. We, we basically, so you saw that diagram of going from a service to uh, an API, but behind the scenes on the runtime, there is a bigger picture story, right? How do you architect these domains? How do you say, if I'm a warehouse management system, this is my uh, third-party logistics project, this is my freight forwarding project, each one has an external API, each one has uh, an internal gateway which can do like east-west communication using a service mesh. Uh, how do you control access, saying someone from this project can only access an API in another project through the edge gateway, so on and so forth, right? There's a, there's a whole lot of architectural principles. And then how do you run this in a multi-cloud setup? How do you do market, uh, marketplace and observability and, and business analytics and so on and so forth, right? So that's the Corio story. You, you would have heard that in different places. I'm not going into details. But you then start mapping all of this. Right? As you can see, you have gateways at each of the, the cells right? uh, or, or the domains. Uh, you have microservices, so that's like the cloud native middleware part. You have the platform engineering, which is a horizontal capability across the board. And then you have developer experience, which is, which is how you bring in automation and everything together into one big uh, picture. Right? So, and, and again, it's not just Corio, right? You, you can build this yourself. Organizations are building your own internal platforms. It's a perfectly viable option. Uh, 80, 90% of our customers are doing that today. So, so they, that's not the wrong option, right? So don't, don't get me wrong, right? So Corio is one option, but the theme of the presentation is you have to start thinking API first. You need to start thinking big picture, and you need to start bringing all the teams together. So takeaways from today, and I'm wrapping up. Uh, so treat APIs as products. It's very critical that you start thinking long term for APIs, that you think in terms of the right abstraction. And if a customer comes and says, I need this API to do something that it is not doing today, maybe you create another version of the API. So think product, right? Focus on internal enterprise marketplaces. This is very, very critical, right? Uh, you, yes. The shiny new tool is exposing APIs externally, but internal marketplaces is very critical. Uh, there are different types of APIs. It's not just REST. You have WebSockets, you have WebSubHub, you have uh, GraphQL for, for high velocity use cases. Pick the right type of APIs. There are new technologies coming daily, but the interface should remain the same. Because you don't want to go and say, 100 consumers, now go and change your API signature. Right? You don't want to do that as well. That's why API product is important. Organizations always consume third-party APIs. That's an important enterprise fact that you need to work with. Gateways are commodity, right? so don't, don't worry too much about gateways. Yes, they'll come and go, but the whole program is important. And finally, last but not least, enterprise software engineering is a continuum. There's no lines, right? So it's basically one continuous process, and most organizations are getting there. So I'll wrap up with a, a, a quote that I like about the adaptability, the flexibility as well. And, and designing the right platform and designing the right APIs really provide you with that. Because in today's day and age, organizations need to be flexible, need to be adaptable. So again, thank you very much. Thanks for being here early in the morning. It was the first session. Uh, hopefully, you have an enjoyable rest of the conference today. And uh, thank you.